first of all, enjoy the meal. Now enjoy your coffee. We are going to be presented with uh, some special singing. And our sister, uh, Claudia Agerman, will be uh, presenting two songs to us. We pray that we bless you to you, and uh, the Lord bless you in this day. Philippians 2, 9 and 11 said, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name above all names, and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. is because some of us have come from a background where people who are disabled are looked down upon. In Kenya, in India, when you're a disabled person, you're considered a curse, and so they put you aside, or they would even kill you when you were born. That's a society in which we work, that's where we minister. And God is doing a, a work in Kenya whereby we are able to bring these disabled children and fit them into the educational system so that they can have an education. Before you today, there is a prayer letter, a newsletter, and it's based on the disabled. The sign above us is disability 
is not in ability. We praise God for this land of Canada where we are blessed to have services and facilities to be able to help the disabled and let them be counted as one in society. Many countries, that just does not happen. The grave is the only open door that they have. And I trust as Mark shares with you today, and as we share what's happening in Kenya later on, that you, are, you would begin to understand. When I go to Kenya, there's a young lady, her photograph is in the newsletter. She is a disabled person. I'm not that good in computers. But when I have computer problems, she's the one who solved my problems. And I'm thankful to God for her. Mark, God bless you. Good morning to you all. This is my first speaking engagement since I had um, a blood infection. I have been disabled all my life. Um, they didn't hold out much hope then, and they didn't hold out much hope over the last nine months. So it's, it's God's will that he left me um, so many years ago when they didn't expect me to live. They had my dad choose the name, sign the birth certificate, and sign the, um, the death certificate at the same time. And so they put me in an incubator and they said I might live three, month, uh, three weeks or less. And a baby, as you know, loses a pound when they're born. So they basically, this is to just give you a little bit of my background. Um, I am cerebral palsy. I, at one point, I could do nothing. And in those days, it took three doctors and both parents to sign me in to a full-time care facility without giving me a chance. And mom thought it through very carefully, and she said, God gave her to us. He allowed her to live. So we will make the decision as time goes on. And the doctors came back to her and said, you're taking on one of the biggest burdens you'll ever have in life. What they did for me is they taught me how I would live with cerebral palsy, as I learned to understand. So I have always carried a one thing with me, that I am cerebral palsy, but I don't live there now. And so, uh, leading into this year, I had a blood infection, and they estimate that it was in my blood for approximately three years. They could not tell because of the time I came into the hospital. I came in under a real emergency. If I hadn't gone in on the 8th of January, I would have dropped dead at home. Um, they didn't hold up much hope because I went delirious after I was admitted into Sunnybrook. Uh, they, instead of coming out of it, I went deeper and deeper and deeper into it. I could hear people around me talking, examining me, and discussing, we don't like this, she's going deeper instead of coming out. And so they uh, treated my feet, my legs, my arms, every single part of my body, once the skin was broken with this blood infection, just took over once I was put in the hospital. It did not enter my brain. 
and it did not enter my spine. Um, I have a curvature which I've had since 1958. They discovered it. And at that time, my orthopedic surgeon said, I will not touch it. And uh, so, if she's in pain, we'll have to just medicate her every hour on the hour. I've never had a bit of pain, even with this blood infection, in my spine. But they, did, they had everything in place um, when they transferred me to Bridgepoint. They had to put a top doctor on staff. They had the physical therapy, the speech people there, because I had to learn to speak again, I had to learn to sing again, um, I had to learn to wear clothes again, and I had to go right back as if I was a little child of seven years old. I did not speak well, uh, I lost my voice, and it didn't come out the way it should have come out. So they gave me speech, they gave me music lessons because they discovered when they did my background how well I took to music and how I could even read music. Years ago I couldn't, but I learned to read music by being in different choirs and traveling with mass choirs and learning to do it without looking at my music. And so they thought, okay, we'll put her in every program we've got. And they put me in cooking, they put me in um, social programs, they put me in everything they could name. But they didn't think really I would amount to anything. Um, but they found that I have a, a real strong will. But they also found out I was born again Christian. And I became friends with the priests there, and I um, was a witness to all the Catholics and all the mixed denominations that were there. Um, when we went to service on Sunday, I would let all the others take turns, and for an example, Thanksgiving. And to just to see what people really thought of Thanksgiving. And one man that was in there, he could hardly move. And I counted my blessings every time I went to one of those services. Because there was always somebody worse off than me. And so they asked him, try to tell us what Thanksgiving means to you. And what they were trying to do is bring out the theme of the, of the service before. And so he said, Thanksgiving means to me I have a good dinner with a turkey. <laughs> and everybody seemed to smile. And uh, they went around the room, and nobody could give the true meaning of um, Thanksgiving. And so I said in the most simple way, um, Thanksgiving means that God has given everyone that has the ability to grow from the earth the food that we might gather in for the winter, but we all took a thanksgiving for everything that is growing and for how God has brought us to up to this point. I was trying to make it real simple, <laughs> and it's very hard when you know the scriptures to make it too simple. Um, and so, actually, when we finished the, the one meeting, the discussion said, Mark, um, you know your scriptures, but you're finding it hard to make it real small. But I also was involved very much so in an organization, Conquerors. That's for the disabled, uh, physically challenged, as I like to say, adult. And I was on the board of directors, and my job there was to raise funds. And I can tell you people there, here now, that that's one of the hardest to raise. But if you get a dedicated group of people, um, you'll make it. And the biggest thing in ministry today is 
have a good, strong prayer chain. That's the foundation of any ministry. And I have people praying for me that I didn't even know. I, I had strangers coming to my room and praying for me when they couldn't bring me out of how deep I was when I went delirious. They were talking to me, they were doing everything, and I could not come out. I could not open my eyes. And then all of a sudden, God touched me, and he was standing right with me, and he said to me, put, my, put your hand in mine, and I'll bring you through. And as close as I was to death, he opened my eyes, and I seen a, bunch, a group of nurses standing around my bed. My health card does not permit for private nursing. And so they decided on their own for many, many days and nights to take turns sitting by my bedside, watching if I would come out of it. And I left there with everybody in tears because they call me the miracle of 80, um, 538 bed one. And they all said if God had a way, um, they would invite me back to be a volunteer there. Um, that hasn't happened yet, and I'm still praying about it. But I always count my blessing each and every day as I awake that I'm now walking again for the fourth time when they said it was impossible. And I am now back in the home that God gave me um, quite a few years ago with very little changes and the changes that will be made you won't notice. And when they came back to do the inspection with me um, before they would allow me to come home, because normally, with, with a condition of mine, I, they wouldn't have let me come home. But they came in and inspected my home, and they watched how I operated. And it's hard to be watched, but I should have been used to it, because people have observed me from the time of my birth. So, but for some reason, it was pretty hard to watch. Um, and go through the steps I had to go through. But one thing when they asked me at Bridgepoint when I was able to go down for my orientation, they asked me, what's your goals at Bridgepoint? And I said, excuse me? I've never been here, so could you explain that? So they did. So I said, my first goal is to be strong enough and and the first goal I would choose, and I did it backward, now that I realize, um, to go back to Pearl Haven's Bible Conference on the last week of July, the 1st of August, and I returned there this year. I did not miss. And then the second one was to get my legs going and be strong enough to be able to stand. And then I thought, well, that's kind of not right with it. I should get my feet going too. So, because the feet carry the legs. But there's one thing they cannot do. My neck was damaged. So I have to be very careful because if the part that was damaged snaps, it will kill me instantly. They cannot do it because they would have to start at the stem of the head and work down from there, and that would be very risky. It could be a possibility that they could bring me through it, but really it would be too risky to try because I could, I could die while they were trying to do that. They can treat it, they can massage it, but I have to be very careful. The damage was done by a family member over the years, but this, this last time, was the violent time. Um, she doesn't want to face that, so she doesn't uh, recognize it. But I got medical proof that I couldn't have done it to myself. It was from over the years having whip lashes to begin with. And then this year, 
by pulling my head back suddenly and then pushing me forward again. Um, the doctor said it was a miracle that she didn't snap your neck at the time she was doing it because she could have dropped out her feet. I've accepted that, but the hardest thing to do is because she knew what she was doing and why she was doing it. And one thing that I learned is that never, never, never sit on very, very high furniture because it affected my circulation and there's many types of this. And it was because I was sitting without having the circulation moving through the body the, the way it should be. And the more I spoke about this to her, the more violent she became. And what I learned before is that when she gets these urges, she has to keep going until the urge wears out. Um, and so she was going to clean my feet and exercise the mas uh, massaging. But let me tell you, it wasn't like that. It was like somebody sanding a paper, uh, table to refinish. And the more, if you said anything, she would do it harder. And I will never forget, I held back. I pretended I didn't feel it, but the pain to, um, that I went through when, when she finally broke the skin, and they said to me, the skin specialist said, you couldn't have done it to yourself. Because the way the skin was broken, it had to be violently done by someone. So I was very honest with teams at both hospitals, and I said, I'll tell you the truth. And I, I said, as long as you can try to help me, I will tell you whatever you need to know. And even when I was in the hospital, they had to tell her to be careful, because she didn't believe there was any damage to my neck. So she came a few times and brushed my hair so hard that she was pulling my head back. And her, her reaction to the nurses said, oh, she's always complaining about her neck, but I know there's nothing wrong. She wants a, to have an attention, and she, she knows how to get it. And so the nurse said, you come in here again with that hairbrush, and the hairbrush will be taken. And uh, so she didn't, didn't stop it, so the nurse hid the hairbrush. And it's pretty hard. I've been advised. I have had lots of counseling. Um, spiritually, I've had lots of counseling otherwise. And they all say you should carefully think of laying charges. And I, but it's a hard thing to do. I mean, i got medical proof now, no matter what. They have, I've had images taken. I've got all kinds of things done. Um, Tests I have never heard of. One test took three and a half hours, and it was all on imaging and cameras. And all of a sudden, I heard this funny noise, and I said, "It sounds like waves hitting against the shore before a storm." If you were up north, and of course the technician couldn't really talk then because he was pushing all kinds of buttons, and he said, "I cannot." I cannot talk right now, but I'll explain what that noise meant. And what it was, is my heart was going so fast, I could have had a heart attack right in front of me. My heart was going so fast, uh, it was at the danger point. So he explained that those waves I described was my heart and how fast it was going. Because I was a small baby to begin with, so I have a smaller heart. All my organs are not, I mean, they're operating, but my, my body inside were, was all very small. And, but I've never had a headache with this um, blood infection, which really surprised everybody that was involved with me. And I never had a temperature, which was another thing, because with this type of blood, infection, I could, should have been running a very high temperature, and I wasn't. So, 
There was miracle touching by God's hand even with this because I, um, they did, took an image of the inside of my head because I said, don't open my head, you can do anything you want, but nobody's ever opened my head. And so they had some way of looking inside and everything was normal inside and the damaged nerve is still there. And the blood, no piece of blood that broke off at birth is still just touching the nerves. Nervous part that controls the nerves of your body, uh, like the control of your body and that kind of thing. So God has been on my side from time of birth to now. And I know he has more of a journey for me to walk. So never give up. If you've got anybody physically challenged in your family, never give up and God will see you through it. He'll give you strength that you don't know where it comes from, but it comes from Him. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Mark very much for that testimony. And um, it's just a little to, to show you what, again, what God can do with the little that we have. You, you may think that we are small, we don't have much that we can give to him. But even in her condition, God has made her a blessing to many, many people. And time would not afford us to be able to share with you. Even the times we were, that we had together when we were all in Willowdale, um, how God has miraculously and wonderfully used Mark. So Mark, thank you very much and God bless you as you continue to serve him and live by him. I know our time is going, we are way behind time. Um, I'm going to ask you just to be able to just stretch your legs very quickly and um, we'll just sing two uh, verses of uh, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say. We'll sing the first and the third verses. And then we'll go right into a presentation I, I, I need to share with you. I just want to say thank you very much for your prayers and support and participation over the past year. God has been really good to us and for which we gave Him all the praise and all the glory. Um, very quickly, this is just a little bit of what the Lord has been doing um, this year. And uh, I'm just going to go through this very quickly so you can uh, get a glimpse of it. Not everything that has transpired over the year, but uh, just a few things. Go ahead, Sam. This is our medical mission to Diana early in the year. Could we hit the lights, please? Yeah, a few shots on the medical clinics. This is in the schools, health education in the schools. Uh, this is up in the real boonies of Guyana in the rainforest. That's where myself and some of the men slept. Downstairs was our dining room and kitchen. There, there's our dining room. Uh, our modern day stove. Uh, this is one of the clinics, a young lady who was running very high fever, had malaria. Go ahead. One of the other clinics. Marilyn doing health education. There she is again. Traveling up in one of the rivers in the uh, Amazon rainforest. Picking up some kids on the way. That's a clinic that we held. These are people who will travel for miles and miles, coming from tributaries and different creeks to get some medical attention. Again, with the little kids singing and teaching them about Jesus. That's the best picture you can find. <laughs> That's our medical team. Board of transportation and helping some of these kids get to their destination. Another location. It's 
is Kenyan is here. Again, this is a little group of people, uh, all disabled, and uh, the majority of them are Muslims. And uh, a friend of mine who is on a board in Kenya, he started this little ministry uh, to the disabled, and so they are able to teach them about the love of God. Uh, there he is, he himself is a disabled person in a wheelchair, physically handicapped, or physically challenged, I would like to say. This is one of our schools with children in that school, uh, has about 600 and something students, and this is a class for the disabled. That's one of our good projects. You can see the goats there. It started with four goats, and two years after, that's what you're looking at. Um, these are, this is a welcome uh, ceremony for uh, coming in. Um, most of you may not have known, but I think I'll share it with you. I was honored as a Maasai elder in Kenya, and every new district I go, there's a, there's a cer ceremony, and they do present you with gifts. That's their culture. That's one of their gifts. It opens the door for ministry. This is one of the ladies' group with goats again. Another one, but this is not goats, it's a sheep. Can you see the difference? <laughs> Anybody knows the difference between a goat and a sheep? How do you know? The tail of the goats are up and the tail of the sheep is down. There we go. That's it. That's another group. This is also another group. That is um, basically sharing with them and telling them how to take care of the groups, I mean of the goats and sheep, and how they are to, how they will manage them so that they can really multiply. Here we are providing a better breed of sheep for them, so crossbreeding with what they have will give them a better sheep. That's um, one group. Uh, would you believe that that sheep, ram sheep that you're looking at is approximately 150 pounds? One guy couldn't lift him up. These are the Gala goats that we were able to um, acquire to crossbreed with their goats. ISCF school in Kajiado, that's our ISCF board. Three principals and three school teachers. For the board. These are some teachers that came to get the sponsors for a day of training. Even the primary schools are asking for an ISCF club to be in their school. Teaching the Word of God at that age. It's very important. That's one of our ISCF clubs. This is a school where we were launching a club for the first time in this school. And we celebrated it with a tree planting little ceremony, planting a tree. That's one of our largest Bible clubs. It's, all, it's almost 600 plus uh, in size, the AIC school. That's addressing the ISCF uh, Bible club. This is meeting with the uh, student committee in the school that are in charge of the ISCF club. And the girls here, we have encouraged them to do one-on-one -on -one, um, witnessing and discipling. And they have started a gardening uh, in the school compound. It's a boarding school. And so if you would notice carefully, you notice that there are little groups. And what they're doing as they do their gardening, they're uh, discipling and praying and witnessing to other students. This is meeting with the Messiah. What has happened here is that the Messiah community um, is very concerned about what we were doing with the Maasai, um, with the Maasai women. Maasai, as you would know, never own anything. The Maasai woman doesn't even own herself. She's the property of the husband. And so when we start giving them sewing machines and teaching them to sew, giving them goats, we were scared. I must confess. Uh, you do not mess around with Maasai. They are warriors. But God would, as God would have it, the men were uh, very tolerant and they wanted to know what we were going to do for them. So I said to the, uh, um, the counselor, 
let's have a meeting with the Maasai. So this, on this occasion, they came together. Over a thousand Maasai men and women. And we were able to talk with them. And so they are eager to work with us and have us work with them. After that, these were women cooking. And they fed us after the goat. <laughs> Not the goat we gave them though. <laughs> This is one, another of our ayahs here from the club. This was held in the evening. Believe it or not, the only instrument they have is that um, yellow container you see. It's their drum. And they sing to that, they dance to it, they do everything to that. That's by the club. That's another club. On this day, uh, they were planning to have a United ISCF rally, but there was no facility to accommodate nine to 10,000 young people, because that's the size of the ISCF club in the 35 schools put together. And so we had to break it up into several different uh, locations with smaller groups, and you're looking at them now. 1,500, 2,000, in some cases. Uh, pause for a moment on this. The girls put on a drama from the, from the school, these are all students, where the guy on the right, depicting the guy on the right who is supposed to be an old Maasai man coming to the one on the left, wanting his daughter to be his wife. She's 13 years old and he's supposed to be 70 years old. <laughs> But he was offering 40 heads of cattle. Uh, so that was a problem. Rosa. And so what happened, the young, the daughter doesn't want to get married. She ran away from home. Um, she wanted to go to school. She went and, come and told the, relate the incident to her principal. And he, the principal came at the same time when the other the old gentleman came to collect his, his bride. And here was a principal sitting down and explaining to the father, which would you prefer? Forty heads of cattle and give your 13 years old daughter to be a bride? Or would you allow her to have an education, become a doctor or become a lawyer? She builds you a house and you're able to live comfortably. And he, ta he taught about it and he said, you know what, I'm going to give her an education. And there's the other guy, the old guy on the right, blessing her. This is on the same day of the rally, different groups. Another location. We had five different locations on that, on that day, the 21st of July, that was a Saturday, where we had different rallies. So it was speaking from one rally, going to the other, and going to the other, because that's why you see me in one set of clothing. You don't have time to change. I mentioned to you earlier that um, I did, I was privileged to be honored as a Maasai elder, and my Maasai name is Lamaya. The Mayan, and it means special blessing. On this occasion, um, I was receiving a doctorate in psychology and in humanities from UGCSI, that's United Graduate College and Seminary International from the USA, because of the work that we are doing worldwide. These are people that I never knew, but they heard about made through one of our board members, and that's the um, professor from the institution, that's a chancellor, and on this occasion they had the, this was all in Kenya, they had the, um, the band from the army that came in and played, 
and those were three of us. I wish I had time just to give you a little background into what transpired here. But instead of one, it ended up being three. <coughs> That's Lamayan. The gentleman on the right is the ex-mayor of Nairobi. He sits on our board in Kenya now. A um, very fine Christian man. Came to know the Lord pretty close to the end of his term. These are four um, uh, delivery beds that were being donated to a hospital. <coughs> They're in a school in West Pocock. This is specifically uh, for the folks in, Kin in Kingston. Uh, you would recall to our last um, function, we had some girls, they weren't able to come from Kingston, young, young people who went on a drive to raise funds to build a school for the Pocahs. And this is what we are doing. Some of the, trans the materials were sent ahead and we were taking the rest with us. This is the site where the school is being built. Uh, we were able to put that the frame up on the roof. We had rain to contend with. It's 120 feet long and 30 feet wide. That will give them six classrooms. It's finished by now. This is uh, the boundary line between Kenya and Uganda. We were close to the border, so we went across to Uganda and fed sand to do the floor. There we were, stealing sand from Uganda. <laughs> and once you're a folk art or a, or a Maasai, you don't have boundaries. I got away with that. We were uh, showing them how to build um, an outdoor facility for the school. It's a trip to Ecuador. Um, the gentleman in the white uh, is the international uh, director for Junta. Uh, you can see Dr. Pancham in the middle, myself on the right, and our representative on the left, that's um, Isabella Scala. That's uh, the General Hospital of Junta. They have four hospitals, a general maternity, a pediatric, and a mental hospital. <coughs> this is just one of the areas of the general hospital. This, they see something like about 3,000 patients, I think, per day. Now, if you can hold that for a minute, please, Sam. Three, uh, three years ago, uh, Dr. Panjim and myself, when we were there, uh, we took a gift uh, of $500 for Junta. And um, in discussing with the, in the boardroom with uh, some of the board members, they were talking about the maternity hospital that they need, which we, we could have seen because the maternity hospital is overcrowded. People are, uh, women are having delivery in the, in the um, emerge section. And they were having like 100, 110 deliveries per day, a rate of 57 by C-section. And uh, we, I prayed about it and I thought, and between Dr. Pancham and myself, we discussed it and we said, you know what, we put this tower, uh, a new hospital, and we literally launch the fund for the maternity hospital. Now this is what you have following, three, year, two, three years later. That's the, not the foundation, that's one of the floors. The new hospital is going up. And since then they have raised $25 million for the building of the hospital. That's what Nate has done. Sow a seed and God handles the rest. Often is run by Ricardo. That's the man, gentleman I mentioned earlier pertaining to the uh, street gangs in Guayaquil. Uh, at the back next to my, uh, to my right. He runs this orphanage and you look at it, these are all kids that have been abused. And you look at these kids and your heart literally bleeds for them. Uh, you can see the pain in their face and he has a lovely program running. The young man is a volunteer and he's teaching them music. And you can see them. That's a unit that was donated to them uh, by the Rotarians. And um, what that is, it's a soybean uh, juicer. And then they're getting a soybean um, drink out of that. It's a lovely drink, I had it myself. 
for, um, our blessing is that every year we are there, we are having dinner with the Rotarian Club. And there we are. This year the Rotarians from, I think it's Kingston, sent a gift by Dr. Pancham for the Rotarians there, and he was, he was delivering that gift. St. Carlos Hospital and also Hunter Maternity Hospital, um, donations were made uh, by Made FCC, and this year Dr. Pancham did CMEs, which is continuing medical education for the doctors and nurses there. These are some of the gifts that we shipped down for the St. Carlos Hospital. That's a little baby getting exercise because the baby cannot sit up. As Dr. Pancham with all the doctors at San Carlos. This was on the closing day at Junta Maternity Hospital after a week of um, CME there. I mentioned earlier about uh, was it upstairs or downstairs? I don't remember now. Um, we met a gentleman who is a, a priest, Roman Catholic priest from India, um, who went to Ecuador 10 years ago and uh, didn't know a word of Spanish and ended up in the worst place of Ecuador, among the poorest of the poor. And. Um, over the last six years, there he is with Dr. Pancham standing there. His name is Father Simon. Very unassuming, unpredictable type of guy. Very simple. That's the school he has built. One of the six schools, he builds a school at one every year. And um, that school has over 600 students. These are some of the students that live, live with him. Providing jobs for the women in the community, and they work every day, except Sundays. They're doing screen printing by hand. Volunteers for uh, Foundation Kairos. On this last trip, the response that we have had from people um, in Ecuador is to the request is to help them with English as a second language using the New Testament as a textbook. And uh, these are some of the computers that they have in the schools. That's what, another school that we visited. And they've got about 800 in that school. Once a year, every August, we, uh, we take a day off uh, our prayer team that meet once a month for prayer and we go up to Mark Singer's cottage. Mark who is with us this morning. That's his cottage and Mark has dedicated his property to the service of the Lord and we've been doing that for the past, I don't know how many years, I think since 1993. 19 years. It's a time of a feasting, time of fellowship. The best corn you would eat, you would get it up there. I'm not kidding about that. Ask those people who are eating corn, they'll tell you. They go up there every year just for the corn. Yep. And you can do that too. So plan to join us next year. Mark will even take you out on a little boat ride with his people. And this is our prayer time. Sharing the word and dividing up into little groups and, and praying together. Just giving him a token of appreciation and then we will close in prayer before we hit the road. Thank you very much. That's just in brief, maybe a little of what God has been doing over the past months of this year. Let me just back up a little and tell you that in Ecuador we have got a tremendous opportunity to be able to go into the Roman Catholic schools and teach the Word of God. Unheard of. 
but that's what God is doing. And um, what we're hoping to do is we uh, introduce ESL via e-learning. It's, it's, as was mentioned, using the, um, the New Testament as a textbook, and when we get into countries where they are objecting to the Word of God, is to be able to use the classics, like um, John Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress. Um, those of you who are young like me, you would remember Uncle Tom's cabin. Those are good classics. But in doing that, uh, there is going to be a link as to who is providing this service uh, free to people. And that link is going to be bringing them straight to MAID, FCC, where they can see what MAID is doing um, around the world. And on MAID's website is going to be a place where they can go and read the Word of God and study it likewise. So in this way we will be able to reach the unreached. Now you may ask the question, how are you, what are you going to do in the places where there is no electricity? Well, the Lord has provided. We have a gentleman in the States who is putting together a package where we can be able to uh, put in a solar panel, because computers doesn't take that much energy uh, to get going, and also put up a dish whereby it can receive the signals directly from satellite. And that way we can go literally to any part of the world and teach them. Not just, not only the Word of God, but see that they have access to getting an education. God is looking for instruments that He can use. And as you sit here this morning, you are one of those instruments. It can be an instrument of prayer, it can be an instrument that will participate in the program, it can be an instrument that will pledge to the program. Whatever way you can be of help, as I always say, be the hand of God extended to someone in need. Yes. Be the hand of God extended to someone in need. And with that, I'll close because our time is far gone. And I'll hand you right over back to Ken. I think um, Ken Olu, or, I mean Ken Burton has a song he's going to share, and then uh, we'll have Harold close off with us with a word of challenge. But you will have an opportunity, as Ken is coming, you will have an opportunity today to give and to be God's hand extended. My favorite phrase you all know, little is much. Thank you. When God is in God bless you.
We have been brought together for fellowship, for working together, for sharing together, for praying together, for helping together, for encouraging together. And I was thinking particularly of this expression of Paul in writing that wonderful little church in Philippi. And you know, he said, I thank God for you, and I make request with joy for you, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. God greatly desires your fellowship and my fellowship, and he greatly appreciates and enjoys our fellowship with one another, our sharing together, our working together, our praying together, are encouraging one another, are helping one another. That's what God saved us for. He wants our fellowship with himself, but he wants our fellowship as a body of Christ, a member of the body of Christ. And you know, just being thrilled with this thought, Paul says, look, right in the Corinthians there, that wealthy, poor church, with all kinds of problems, but he says, we're workers together with God. With God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? What a, what a privilege. What an opportunity to work together. With, together. You know, as, as Arnie was talking to us, he said, God wants to use you and me as his hands. He wants our fellowship with him one another. And how can we do it? <laughs> how can we do it? We can pray, we can work together, we can put an effort into it. An effort. We can encourage one another. Praise God for this group of people here today that are willing to work together <laughs> to support me and FCC. What a privilege. What a joy. What a reward there's going to be. What a joy. Paul, Paul said, you know, in writing Thessalonians, he said, you know, you're going to be our joy and our crown and rejoicing at the day of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> oh, boy. What a, how, what a payoff. Some of them say, you know, my pension's out of this world. My payoff day's out of this world. To, to, to just... Fellowship together. That's what God created us for. He created us in his image and likeness. And mankind fell through sin, but he provided this wonderful opportunity for fellowship with him and fellowship in the body of Christ. What a joy. And how did they do it? Well, he said about the churches in Macedonia, which Philippi was one of the most outstanding. He says, look... Out of the depth of your poverty, extreme, abject poverty, he said, your liberality abounded. abounded. Reminds me of the, the preacher that got up and he said, you know, I have good news and bad news for you today. He said, the good news, we've got the money for our new church roof. The bad news is it's in your pockets. <laughs> <laughs> but you seem to have fellowship, you've got to get it out of your pocket. Yes. Right out of your pocket. And you got to share it. God's a sharing God. He shared his son with us. He gave him to Calvary for me, for you. He wants us to share. He wants to share in our prayer. Share with our encouragement. Share with our being together. If we love God, the Apostle John says, we will love those who are begotten of God, will love fellow Christians, and will love the people that they're serving Him. We'll seek to serve them too, and to help them, encourage them, pray for them, and we'll give, we'll take it out of our pockets, because it doesn't belong to us anyway. It belongs to the Lord, we're just stewards of it. So may the Lord encourage us to be godly. God's a God of fellowship. May the Lord help us to fellowship with him with one another and to cause him to, to have joy as he sees us having fellowship in the gospel 
and the outreach to those who need our Savior, who need to be redeemed, to be brought to God, and to be saved for time and for all eternity. May the Lord just bless you. Amen. I feel challenged personally, don't you? <laughs> Thank you, Harold, for that message and for that challenge to us. May the Lord use it in a very special way. We come to the point now where, and I'm very thankful that you made that uh, example of uh, providing for the roof. There's so much of uh, need for mate, and you know um, it's endless, uh, right around the world. And so, therefore, we have the money for our needs, but it's in your pocket. <laughs> so, praise God for that. So, we're going to ask you now, there is on the table, uh, before you, they are um, offering envelopes. They're also, if you want to make uh, a continuing uh, offer, uh, a donation, uh, it's there. You can please yourself on that. Um, so, whatever applies to you personally, we've asked at this time if you look at that and uh, make your uh, support to us. We'd be very grateful. I just want to let you know that on, the, on your table as well, there are slips of paper that if you would like to uh, be involved and make um, in prayer, in participation, or in monthly pledges, please use the little slip of paper that you have and um, just put, the, put it with the offering in the center of the table and we'll have someone pick, pick it all up together. Um, again, I cannot help but say thank you to each and every one of you for uh, being with us today. I want to say thanks to Joe for preparation and uh, thanks to uh, Ken, dear wife, for sharing. For Claudia, who has just left, just want to say thank you. Thanks a lot to each and every one of you. This is your ministry. It's not ours. Our mates, uh, those who are involved in this. It's, we are all in it together. As how right he said, we fellowship together with Christ in his work. And may God continue to bless you and encourage your heart. Maybe we should uh, close in prayer as, uh, as we uh, finish up. And I'm going to ask Sam to uh, just come close for us. Just before we close in prayer, we have one last order of business remaining. Um, Main FCC, we've decided to institute uh, an annual Achievement in International Sand Smuggling Award. Um, it's a joke. You're all wondering, who did I give money to? Um, just to make sure you're still awake. We're going to ask Michelle to come and to uh, make a presentation at this time. Thank you, Sam. Um, my name is Michelle. This is my little sister, Sarah, who's just helping me out. Um, so I was asked, uh, Ken approached me about uh, doing this, so I'm just going to explain what's happening. So um, many of you um, know Arnold as the mission director of MAKE. Um, affectionately at our home, we refer to him as Uncle Arnie, so as I explain this to you, please uh, forgive me for that. Um, so many of, many of you know, as his position at MATE, Uncle Arnie is able to travel around the world to many countries um, where he's able to help by the power of God to um, help change the lives of many, many people. 
Uh, last year, I had the privilege of traveling to Kenya and Uganda with him and a small team of, of other members, where I was able to see firsthand the wonderful ways in which God has used his leadership and work at this mission to better the lives of thousands of people, but most importantly, to share the good news of Jesus. On our recent trip to Kenya, as you saw earlier in the presentation, Uncle Arnie was awarded an honorary PhD um, in psychology and humanities from the United Graduate College and Seminary International. Um, Uncle Arnie, today we would like to present to you a lovely gift on behalf of our friends here today just to thank you for how you've let God use you. It has been such an encouragement and a blessing to see the ways in which uh, you've let God work in your life, and we've very, been very inspired and very blessed to see that. Um, on the plaque, it, or the little gift here it says, in honor of Dr. Arnold Dubay for his commitment and service to Jesus Christ and the people of the world, from the board, members, and volunteers and friends of May FCC. So if you can't see up there, it's just, uh, it's very, very nice. It has a uh, little sculpture of Jesus washing someone's feet. And Uncle Arnie, as we, oh, you can clap for that. <laughs> we just want to thank you for what you've served the world in so many ways. And we just want to um, ask this of God for you. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every good way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. So, Uncle Arnie, on behalf of all of us here, thank you for letting God use you. Thank you very much, and it's all to the glory of God. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you very much to everyone for attending, uh, for being patient with the, the delay in our program. If we went any longer, we would have to amend the program to refer to it as perhaps Brinner instead of brunch. Uh, but we're very happy that you, you came and you heard a little bit of what uh, the Lord is doing. Uh, God is doing tremendous things. Uh, I have the privilege, uh, apart from my role with MATE, to, uh, to work with believers around the world who live in areas of very high persecution. Uh, and the one thing that has been driven home to me is that our God is a God of victory. The enemy can do his worst, and he does. But we are on the winning side. We know how the story ends. And what you've seen here today is God's victory. And as you have heard about the need, you should be encouraged to meet that need. But be encouraged that God can do much with what we do. Whether it's through our time, through our money through our effort, whatever it is, God can take that little bit and God can turn it into a tremendous victory. So thank you for being a part of this. Thank you to, to all who shared and who participated in this event. And we look forward to having you back uh, at our next event. And we would encourage you to stay up to date with the newsletters that you have, that you perhaps receive. Use those to pray. Uh, God is working through prayer. We see miracles uh, every day through the power of prayer. So let's be encouraged, and thank you again for coming, and let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege that is ours to serve you. Father, when we consider that you are a God of fellowship, and that you chose to include us into that fellowship, that we could have, as your word would say, fellowship, with the Father and with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, that thought transcends our understanding of how it is that the Lord Jesus Christ could say to the Father that the Father and the Son are one. 
and that we are in Christ, and Christ is one with God. Oh, Father, what a blessed thought this is. And Father, we thank you that we have fellowship with one another. We thank you for this time that we have spent together as brothers and sisters in the Lord, as co-laborers. Father, we thank you for the victory that you are winning around the world. We thank you that the gospel is going forth in power. We thank you that people's needs are being met physically, but Father, more importantly, spiritually, as they're being introduced to the one who can meet all of their needs and who can give them an eternal inheritance and an eternal reward in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we would pray a blessing on the offering that has been taken. Father, we know that you can do much with our little. Father, we remember how your son, when he was on this earth, fed thousands of people with a small boy's lunch. And Father, we thank you that you will take what has been given today and that you will use it for your glory and for your honor and for the furtherance of your kingdom. And Father, we count ourselves blessed and privileged to be partakers of this work, to be laborers in your kingdom, to be striving for the enlargement and for the edification of your kingdom, Father. And we know that we are only vessels because your son promised when he was on this earth, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Father, we know that this is your work. This is uh, your kingdom. And Father, we thank you that we can be a small part of what you are doing around the world. So bless us now as we would part. Encourage our hearts. Spur us on to greater service, to greater fellowship, to greater commitment as we would go and we would continue in all those areas where you have placed us. Bless us now as we would part in your son's most worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen.